Welcome everyone, the hour being 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday, May 3rd, 2023. The Twilla City Council and the Redevelopment Agency are meeting in a work meeting being held at the Twilla City Hall Council Chambers located at 90 North Main Street. This is also being electronically broadcasted on the Twilla City YouTube channel. We will start with a roll call. Councilwoman Manzio. Present. Councilman Hansen. Present. Councilman McCall. Present. Councilman Graff. Present. He is joining us by phone right now. I'm Councilman Brady, I'm also present. We'll move on to item three, which is the mayor's report. Thank you, Chairman and Council. Uh, the first item that I just want to update you a little bit on is the same thing that we've been talking about now for weeks and months, and that is the potential flooding. Um, we know that the Salt Lake area has been impacted already. We did notice that yesterday there were uh, some posts on Facebook about Grantsville. They've got some water running down Clark Street. So um, I think we're all just watching and, and waiting. But I do want you to know that the, the staff has, uh, has been monitoring both canyons and residential areas of the city. And our uh, Roads Department, Public Works, and Emergency Services have been covering several miles a day to make weekly assessments of the areas uh, that may be potentially have the water running down, especially the, the canyons. And we do know that the water flows have picked up significantly, but uh, we've not seen a lot of it. In fact, some of the ditches are still dry, and that is because water is piped to certain areas. And we know that the water that comes out of uh, the canyons, some of that is used for irrigation. So uh, we did hear from the irrigation company today uh, that the, the reservoir, the, the Settlement Canyon Reservoir, has risen a, a little more than two feet in, since Monday. So that's three days. We know that what the weather is doing, melting the snow, but it's supposed to get cold again, and that's what we want. So it so it slows that down. Um, but you know, I know that there are residents of the city that think that the reservoir is is culinary water for Tooele City. It is not. It is a reservoir for the irrigation company. But we work closely with them, mm -hmm. and and we work like I say we work together to stop any of those potential flooding issues. But as much water can get in that reservoir is that much culinary water that will not be used, so we're grateful to see that filling up. I do want you to know that we have um, approximately 6,000 fields filled sandbags that the city has stored ready at a moment's notice that we can place. We also have 31,500 empty st sandbags still on hand if we need those. We did have a an awesome donation from a local resident that gave us 2,500 uh, empty sandbags and 10 filling stations that he had, had had made. So we're just we're very thankful and grateful for that donation. And so far, we have gone through 330 tons of sand, and residents have have filled over 18,000 sandbags. So that just shows what an awesome community that we have. That everybody is stepping up and helping, and we're going to be ready if and when uh, the flooding may happen. I want to invite you and uh, all of our residents down to the Lee Pratt Aquatic Center this Friday evening at 5 p.m. The first thing that we're going to be doing that evening is uh, recognizing the naming of the lap pool, which will be the Mel Roberts um, lap pool. And uh, we talked about this in, a, you know, you guys approved this late, uh, earlier this year, and we have a beautiful plaque that is now going to be displayed there at the pool. Uh, so we're going to take care of that first. That's an awesome thing that we can do to recognize his accomplishments and what he has given back to our city. And then we will have a 20th birthday party for our pool. That building, the Lee Pratt Aquatic Center, is 20 years old. So we'll have free swimming that night, so bring your swimsuit if you want to participate in that, or you can sit up in the bleachers with me and watch. <laughs> 
Uh, the last item that, that I want to just make citizens aware of, uh, we, are, we are into May. I don't know what happened to April, but we are into May. And uh, this is when we really start our cleanup. The, we uh, the warm weather has come now, and we're trying to encourage residents to clean up our city. And the, we always have one bulky waste day per month, but during the month of May, we offer two of those. And they can find that information in their 90 North Main newsletter that they receive with their utility bill, or it, that calendar is also available on our website. So please take advantage of the bulky wake waste pickup of anything that's too large to go in your garbage can. And there are some rules. We need to kind of keep it bundled up and cleaned up so that they can easily pick it up. But I've seen a lot of stuff out already. There was a pickup day uh, yesterday, and there is one tomorrow. So people are ready. I'm just real excited about it. And then we want to welcome everyone, invite them on Saturday, May the 20th, from 9 AM to noon. Uh, we will all be up at the Twilla Valley Museum. That's where we're going to start and in the Broadway area. And we're going to paint graffiti and we're going to just clean up, whether it's sweeping out the gutters or just cleaning up leaves, whatever the debris is, picking up trash. And we invite everyone uh, in the city to come up and help us. So we're really looking forward to that and that will be awesome. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. We'll move on to item four, which is the council member's report. We'll start with Councilman McCall. Oh, I just uh, attended the um, spring meeting with the rest of you guys, and that was about it. It was good. <laughs> Mr. A. You missed me? <laughs> <laughs> you like your eyes, miss. <laughs> so, one of the things that I really enjoyed was going to the fire department recognition banquet, and we had some men there that were honored. Bud Pendleton, Jim Jensen, Earl Cole, Larry McFarland, Ron Baum, Gary Kuhn, Harry Shinton, they're all men that I look up to and, and uh, they've been in our fire department and great leaders in our fire department over the years. So they were honored for a time of service, but we have a lot of fire department men there that have been there a long time and serving us and taking care. And now we have a full-time fire chief, Chief McCoy, and everything seems to be going great. So looking forward to all the wonderful things that will happen with that. And, and it was just neat that night to be able to honor them that night. Went to planning commission meeting, enjoyed that. There was some lively debate that night, and so it was exciting. So it was, it was a good meeting. And then our uh, downtown alliance is doing a downtown fest. It's being advertised kind of everywhere we can, but that's going to be on June 10th. We had it last year, I think, in May, but this year, June 10th, and car show and vendors and things like that. So it'll be fun to try and get people walk in the downtown area. And that's my report. Thank you. Councilwoman Manzio? Um, sure. I went to many of the same things. The spring conference was great. The fire department <coughs> was really good. And I was going to mention the same thing about planning commission. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, they had a great discussion. It's a really good discussion. Um, and then um, just to, to let you know, the Arts Council is work, has made some changes in the way they're doing their budgeting and taking their payments for classes and such. So they're making some changes there that are good changes, I think, for the city. Um, and they have some great plans for this summer. And Fridays on Vine will be starting up soon, so make sure to get that schedule and put it on your calendars. We have some good um, people coming. So and I went to a great pre-development meeting today also. That's all I have. Thank you. Councilman Graff? Yes, I had a chance to attend the uh, Utah League of Cities and Towns Convention in St. George. It's got a lot of useful information. Also, echoing uh, Councilman, uh, the Councilman's report about the Fireman's Banquet. It is a pleasure to attend that, and I always walk away grateful for what they do for us and what they have done for us. And also echoing uh, Councilman Manzio and about Fridays on Vines. It's an exciting lineup, and I'm excited to participate in that this year as well. And that concludes my report. Thank you. I also attended the Utah League of Cities and Towns, and it was a great conference. They they have a speaker that comes down there, and he talked about the Dignity Index, about how we all know where politics are going, especially on the, the federal level. and just respecting each other. So it's always nice to hear that being talked about more often. 
Uh, the fire department banquet was excellent. And then yesterday we had a tree board meeting. Uh, Darwin was there for that as well. And the plan is to plant 42 trees, is it? At the Wigwam Park on May 22nd, am I correct? Okay, so super excited to see that park be developed and improved. So that is all I have for my report. We'll move on to our discussion items. The first one is a discussion on resolution 2023-23, a resolution of the Twila City Council amending its policy allowing payment of fee in lieu of water rights conveyance. This is presented by Roger Baker, the city attorney, and he's joining us by phone. Thank you, Council. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to attend the meeting in this fashion today. Uh, to be brief, in 1998, when the City Council passed the Water Rights Exaction Chapter 726 in the Code, uh, they drafted into it a provision that allowed the Council to instead of requiring the conveyance of actual water rights to allow a fee to be paid in lieu of conveyance of those water rights. And that was to be pursuant to a city council policy. That policy was first adopted in 2007, almost 10 years after the initial ordinance was enacted. It was amended in 2008 expanded in 2015 and in 2022 the council uh, amended the policy simply to update the price for which uh, water credits would be sold or the fee would be paid in thinking how to approach tonight's discussion i thought it might help to Go to the resolution itself where I have listed in a bullet point fashion the high points of the, the revisions that you know, we are proposing to you as the city administration <clears throat> under the mayor's direction. Um, on page 24, uh, begin the, the actual red lines that correspond to these bullet points. And so now, after I touch on each of these high points, if you'd like to go look at any particular uh, red line language, we can certainly do that. Uh, Chairman, does that sound like a satisfactory approach? Yes. Okay. So, part of my objective with this was to put in the policy some things that were already standard practice, and that's the case with this first one, uh, authorizing the staff to authorize the credit in the residential context because it's extremely limited. Uh, these credits can be sold for residential development only for the creation of one single lot in the case where a parcel is split into two. Uh, the new, newly created parcel could purchase a credit by paying the fee. And because the council has established that rule, uh, it's, it's my suggestion that there is no need for it to come back to the council for further legislative action. You've told us what to do, and we'll be keeping that carefully in the residential context. Uh, the rest of the policy is in the commercial or the non-residential context, and that's where we get into um, some, some, a lot more detail. Any questions on that bullet point? No, no questions. Okay, okay perfect. Uh, the next bullet point is I, sim I create a definition for project so that I don't have to say it over and over in the policy non-residential development project. It's just a shorthand, so not a substantive point. Um, the other is, is requiring developers to submit a request to the council to be able to pay the fee. Uh, right now, a formal request is not required, although that is our practice. And so I think it's a good practice to require developers to apply, so to speak, and explain 
to you why you would want to approve the fee in lieu. Right now, the criteria that the council can consider in whether to approve a uh, fee in lieu for a project are optional, they're suggestions, and technically they only apply if someone's asking for more than 20 credits. I don't think that's the intention. I think the intention was to consider these criteria in all cases so that you can make a decision as to what's good for the public. But the way it's written right now, that um, you don't even get to those criteria until we've surpassed 20 credits, and that's quite a high level of credits before we begin to evaluate any criteria. <clears throat> any uh, any reaction to that so far? I don't think so. So far, no. Okay. Thank you. If I were there, I would just look at you, but uh, I'll, I'll just ask from time to time. I don't want to go too fast. Uh, the next bullet point allows for partial approvals of requests. So if, some, if a developer were to ask for 20 acre feet, for example, and the council decided that 20 acre feet is not in the public interest, but 10 would be, then you can partially approve a request. It's not all or nothing for you. Uh, the next one is probably the biggest, uh, one of the biggest uh, changes. And it addresses the problem of what happens if you approve a fee in lieu of credits, of water rights, and you don't see a development application. You don't see a subdivision application, a site plan application, or a building permit. And years go by. Because of the nature of these water rights and the commodity of water, you in the cities of the public interest to approve a request and then just let it languish for years and years and years without being used when it could better be used, perhaps, for another application. And so the proposal in front of you is that a developer who get, obtains approval from you to pay the fee would have two years from that approval date, from the resolution date, to get their subdivision to site in their city, apply for a building permit for their first building, if it's a larger development, and start construction. <clears throat> um, that actually is our current practice uh, for the, the larger developments that will have multiple buildings. And so um, I, I saw no reason for this proposal to, to suggest something different than the current practice. That doesn't mean you can't discuss it now and, and do something different, but uh, that is our current practice. And then what's new, however, is that if, let's say, a development has five buildings, they'd have to get the first building permit by the end of the second year. And then if, before the end of every year after that, they would have to get a building permit for a subsequent building so that for five buildings, you don't get strung along for 10 years. Um, I don't have a sense as to whether that's exactly the right time frame, but I did have a sense that there needed to be a time frame and that it ought to be reasonable. So if a site plan, if a subdivision were to have five commercial buildings, then they would have uh, six years from the date of the, of your approval of the, of the fee in lieu to get their building permits in and get going on their development. And if they're not going to do it, then those credits would revert back to the city. The developer could ask again for your approval uh, at a future time, but this way you're, you're not holding those credits out for an extended number of years without them being used when there may be other developments that you want, that are ready to go, that you want to approve them for. 
Is there any discussion you'd like to have on those sunset dates? So, so Roger, if there was, if they did one and then they and they used most of the water we approved for them for that, and then they didn't do the other buildings, we'd only have access to the water that was left over from the first building, correct? Correct. And after a year passed with no activity, the extra, the remaining credits would revert back to the city. And if they wanted to start their development up again, they could, and they would just have to come back to you and ask again. And they may or may not get your authorization at that point. Right. Okay. I just making sure on that. Yeah. Uh, Chairman, you let me know when the council's ready to move to the next point or if there's more discussion on this point. I think we're ready to move on. Okay, perfect. So uh, when you raised the rate in 2022 from fifteen to thirty-five thousand dollars per credit, you made a statement on the record and in the resolution that actually I think it was just on the verbal record that this was not intended to reflect the market value of the water rights. In fact, just the opposite. You set it at that high rate to discourage people from approaching us for water rights and encouraging them to go to the market. Well, whether it's coincidental or not, the market has met and even surpassed that $35,000 per acre foot level. So I, I suggest it's important to have right in the policy, in writing, uh, disavowing any connection between the price we charge and the market rate. It may not help the market, but I think it's important to make that statement to the market that don't look for us for valuation, because that's not what our, why our fee is set there. Does the council feel comfortable including that concept? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. We've had uh, another thing moving to the second bullet on the second page of the resolution, page three of your packet. Uh, we have had questions arise as to uh, when the price for the credit or when the fee locks in at a certain price. And so I thought it would be useful to just uh, clarify for the development community how we determine what their fee is going to be. And the way I've written it is that the fee charged will be the fee in place on the date that the council approves the resolution. Unless the, unless the developer waits more than a year after your approval to apply for a building permit. And if they do want to wait like that, then the consequence is that they, it's not a punishment, it's just the, the cost of delay, that by the, after a year, the union has decided to raise the price again. So if you give an approval and it takes the developer more than a year to get moving, and submit a building permit, at that point, the price would not be the price at the date of the resolution authorizing the fee. It would be the price on the date of the building permit application. So um, while they can, while they have two years to get their permit to preserve their credits, they only have one year to lock in the price. Uh, because uh, I just wanted to protect your ability to, to set the price and not have it be retroactively applied to all these developers who may have uh, come in earlier. Again, it's not a punishment, but it is trying to recognize that these credits have tremendous value that we don't want people just sitting on. Is there any discussion you'd like to have on the concept of when the price attaches? No, I think that's pretty straightforward to do it like you wrote or suggested. Anyone else? I'm good with that, I'm good with that. yeah. Okay, thank you. The next bullet point 
Uh, we say in our current policy that uh, the council will not authorize more than 50 acre feet per year. And I got to thinking, well, what if someone, what if we sell 50 acre feet in November and December of one year, and then another 50 acre feet in January and February, then we've sold 100 acre feet in one quarter of a year, which kind of undermines the whole idea of putting an annual limit on it. So all I did was add uh, any one year or any consecutive 12 month period so that you're not having to find 100 acre feet in the course of two, three or four months and the wet water, the water source, to support them. But that way it will allow a trickle over the course of a year and not multiply. Um, I want to, wanted to clarify in the policy that there's no paperwork that has to go on here. We, we're not issuing certificates for water rights credits uh, we're approving them by resolution, and they are redeeming them when they uh, submit their building permit application and pay the fee. And once they've paid the fee, they're done. They're, they're, there doesn't need to be a bill of sale or a deed or a certificate of any kind. We already have enough certificates that we track, and this hopefully will simplify the administration of this, this policy. Um, the next one is just... Hey, Roger, can I, I just ask a question on number two? And I, of course. And, it, and it, I don't think it has anything to do with what you changed. It just made me think of something. So you have a limit of 50 per year to be sold, right? In lieu, Correct. In lieu. Okay, so since we we're allowing 50 to be sold, does every one of them still have to come back to the council to be approved? Or since there's 50 there, could that just be done through the staff? That is my question. No, great question. Every request to pay the fee for a commercial development will come to the council with a resolution every time. All right, perfect. That's, that's what I wasn't sure of from there, so thank you. You bet. Uh, the next one regards the revenues that are paid and how they can be used. And uh, the language that I've proposed, it's not much different than it already is, but I did add that the revenues will go into a water rights revenue fund, but that it is the fund of the city's general fund and not an enterprise fund, so that it is dedicated for that use of purchasing water rights and making water improvements, but it's not... An, but it preserves your flexibility to use it how you think best. It doesn't require you to follow the enterprise fund rules of um, public notices and other cumbersome requirements to be able to spend that money. So while I wanted to earmark it, so to speak, the water issues, I didn't want to tie your hands either on that. If that didn't make sense, please let me know. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next two bullet points were to avoid a misunderstanding in the in the market of what we're selling. We are not set, we're not creating stock certificates or any kind of marketable security that can be bought and sold on the market. This is not something that a developer can turn around and sell to someone else. This is not something that entitles a developer to uh, a subdivision or site plan approval. That has to proceed on its own merits independently of this. And it can't be assigned to uh, uh, other companies. And that's to protect you from having the market speculate on your asset at your, at your expense and at the public expense. 
That's the, that's one of the more legalistic uh, recommendations I'm making. Another concept I thought would be important is to indicate that this is not something that someone can come in and prepay. They can't come in and say, you know, we're thinking of doing business in your town. We don't know what we're going to do yet, but we'd like to tie up some water in case um, we want to do it. I'm suggesting that you want to require the development community come in better prepared, better researched, with their concepts better articulated, and to not allow just pre-purchase um, vague. And also, when you do approve water rights for the larger development, um, they can't just prepay for all of their future buildings either. The payment has to be triggered at the time of building permit application. That's when the, the impact fees are triggered. That's when the water rights requirement is triggered, the building permit fees. All of the other fees are triggered with the building permit. And I'm suggesting that that's how we do it here and not allow people to prepay for future speculative building permits. Again, that's to protect your asset. The last two bullet points are not uh, hugely substantive, but I think it's important to say that just because you approve a fee in lieu for one developer doesn't mean you're required to do it for the next one or all of them or any of them or a similar one. You get to decide each time on its own merits without creating a precedent for any future application. I think it's important to state that. The last point is just to indicate that if someone has, if you've approved credits for someone and it turns out their development doesn't need them all, that, uh, that we will give them a refund for the unused credits and then they're back in our inventory. And that's important because Again, the developer that, that pays the, that for whom you've approved these credits can't turn around and sell them to someone else. If they can't use them, then we'll take them back and refund their money. Uh, it seemed fair to me, but also another protection. So that's the summary of the changes we're proposing. Uh, it is to incorporate uh, existing practice and to bridge gaps that we've discovered as these have become more popular for commercial developers. We'd be very happy to go over any of them or to look at any specific language, whatever you'd like. All right, any questions or comments from the council? Seems like it's what we're already doing. Okay, any other discussion? Okay, thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, Captain. We'll move on to our second discussion item, which is a discussion about should Tooele City impose a fine for candidates that do not file a campaign finance statement in a timely manner as per Utah Code 10-3-208-11A-1. Uh, I don't know, double I, what, yeah. <laughs> section two, what that would be. And this is presented by Michelle Pitt, the city recorder. Okay, thank you. Um, so some of the sections of the Utah State Code have been changed over the last couple of years. And it matters this year for us because we're having an election this year. Um, so we used to have um, hard, fast deadlines of when people would need to file their financial statements. Now, they, we have the deadline, and if they miss the deadline, we give them an extra 24 hours to file their campaign um, finance report, and then we may, if we want to, impose a $50 fine. So, um, just to kind of let you know, when candidates do come in to file for office, I do let them know that they will have to file these finance statements. 
and um, they have to file them at certain points along the election calendar. And um, there's usually about four statements that have to be filed throughout this election process. Um, I do email the candidates multiple times to remind the candidates that they're due. And um, just for an example, so they have to, the first one they have to file is seven days before the primary election. So the primary election is August 15th, so it would be due August 8th. If they don't file by August 8th, then I'll notify them, hey, you missed the deadline. You have 24 hours to get in and file this. And then we can, as a city, decide whether to impose a, the $50 fine at that time. Um, the penalty for not filing a finance statement on time is disqualification. So you get your name taken off the ballot. Or if they're already mailed out, they'll be blacked out or um, a note will go in to the um, citizens telling them that they don't vote for that candidate. So I'm just asking you as a council, would you like to impose a $50 fine for candidates that don't file in a timely manner? So regardless with the fine, even if they're not fine, they're, they're still removed from the ballot if they don't. Yes, the penalty is disqualification regardless. That's not up to any of us, but the fine is optional. I mean, I lean towards doing a fine because it's your time that you're putting in. You're sending reminders, right? And it's more work for you and your staff to get that information. So we find other residents in the community for not obeying rules. So I support a $50 fine. That's a valid point. <laughs> I mean, as a candidate, if I don't do it, I, I think there yeah. should be some repercussions. Sure, yeah, I, I agree. I, <clears throat> I think the fine is fine. I don't know. $50 isn't very much, so I just was yeah. sitting there thinking about it. I don't know. I'm not opposed to a fine for sure. So I'm fine with let's, it. Let's do it. Yeah, okay. Um, Is everyone okay with that? Eh? Yep, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. She just put Okay, go ahead. Say what? I paid the $50 bucks for the other headline. I didn't hear the question. Can you say that one more time, Tony? Sure, does that fine also apply to the other deadline? Like post, um, post election, I think there's a deadline as well. I'm sorry, what? Does the fine apply to the other deadlines? Because there's the one, the, the, the one August 8th, and then there's a post election one, right? Yeah, you have to yeah so you have to file one before the um, primary and then after, and then before the general and after. So it would be each deadline. Yes. So you could be fined three you times. Could, <laughs> you could be fined. <laughs> Every time, but no. No. yeah. But the fine is after the 24 hours, right? Right. Yeah. So they have the. There's a little leeway yeah. for disqualification and a fine. Right, and, and I would way. notify the candidates. Hey, you've missed the deadline. You have 24 hours. If you don't meet the 24 hours, you've got to. You'll be disqualified, and you have to pay a fine. And it would never land on a a weekend or anything, right? Because the way the elections are set up. Like they're on right. Tuesdays, mm -hmm. and, okay, midweek. Yeah. Okay. Or we can just, we don't have to do the fine, and we can just leave it at disqualification. So whatever you guys would like. And if we do impose a fine, then we'll um, need to add it to our fee schedule, and then we'll bring back um, an ordinance change to change Title One and Chapter 24 of our city code to... Include that. That might be clear. It comes not worth it. <laughs> and you know, I'm only asking because someone mentioned it to me. Um, could you prepay the two hundred dollars when you? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you don't need to. <laughs> so after the election, though, if you don't file, are you still disqualified? <laughs> yes. You've already been elected. Yeah, yeah. You're already elected. So. Yeah, I mean, there's really not a penalty for. If you don't file it after the election, but um, just fifty dollars, we would have the fine in place. I mean, yeah. to me, that's more of an incentive to have a fine, though. Is mm -hmm. if they can't be disqualified, but 
they got fined fifty dollars. I know fifty dollars isn't a lot uh -huh. to most people, but I, I think it still sets the stage that we expect things to be turned in when they're supposed to, and we respect our city recorder's time and the effort she's putting in to get that information for people who don't do it. So. What do you think? You're well, just giving us this. Really, you want us to decide, but what do you think? I'm really torn because uh, I feel like the disqualification is a big penalty. That's, sure. a, that's a really yeah. a big penalty. So there's already that in place. But, I mean, I do really bug the candidates to death. Like, I will do everything to get them to file these forms so that we don't have to disqualify them because it's a process to do that as well. Um, so in a way, it's like, <laughs> I think, yeah, we should because they should be timely, but the disqualification is a big deal as well. So I don't know. I say yes. You didn't answer yes either. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way. It could go either way, but yeah. I'm leaning towards the fine. So, yeah, let's Teresa find said yes as well. Let's find a. Is that what you guys talking about? Or I, no, I'm, I'm, I, I agree with you guys. Do we get charged extra from the county if you have to disqualify someone and get their name removed from the ballot? They have not said that they'll charge us extra for that. So, we'll just have to make Add sure to. that doesn't happen. <laughs> Have we had to disqualify a candidate in the past? Um, we have almost had to, almost. yes. <laughs> We've had a candidate not file in a timely manner, but uh, we ended up not taking them off their ballot. Mm. Okay. That was before I was a city recorder. <laughs> okay. Council, this is the lecture. I'd like to interject with a brief comment. Is that all right, Chairman? Yes, please. So in that prior occasion, what we did is uh, actually file a pleading in the district court, and we asked the district court to determine what should happen, and uh, we were pleased with the outcome of that. We didn't have to bear the brunt of it, and it was a good outcome, but but it was uh, it did take a lot of resources to go through the courts to get that outcome. Thank you. All right, any other discussion on this item? Tony, I don't know if you have any other thoughts or... No, I, I agree with the sentiment of the council. I think part of running for office is being responsible and hitting deadlines. And I think Michelle's time is with every bit of a $50 fine, so I agree with all of you, and it's a good practice. All right. Okay, we'll bring that back then. And Let's hope we never have to collect it. I hope not. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. All right, our next discussion item is about outdoor landscaping text amendments. This is presented by Andrew Agard, the city planner. Thank you, members of the City Council. Okay. A few weeks ago, we began an evaluation of Tool City's code in regards to specific landscaping requirements. We did this to determine how the code is written in regards to requirements for consistently thirsty turf grass and sod versus dryscape or otherwise water tolerant landscaping. Our intent is to amend the code to require less thirsty turf grass and more water-wise landscaping. As the council is very well aware, water has become a significant issue in our growing city, and we believe that conservation measures are an effective and less expensive way to try and mitigate some of those water impacts. We also wanted to make sure that the city's landscaping requirements are in line with the state of Utah's flip your strip and turf buyback programs. So as you can see, the list of ordinances that include landscaping is quite long. Uh, we have ordinances in Title IV, building regulations regarding landscaping, and then we have ordinances throughout Title VII, the Uniform Zoning Code regarding landscaping. And each one of those types of land uses has various landscaping requirements. So the landscaping requirement for commercial is different from the landscaping requirement for multifamily. 
One of the first areas that we looked at is the city's landscape requirement for park strips. Currently, there is no language in the code that requires sod in the park strip, but as you know, people do put it in the park strip quite often. We wanted to make sure that we see an end to this thirsty sod and turf grass in the park strip, especially for new developments. The amendment to the park strip landscaping material or requirement prohibits sod and requires that non-irrigated landscaping materials such as concrete, rock, cobble, bark mulches, pavers, etc., be used to landscape these narrow strips of land. The amendments also, also authorize street trees, water-wise shrubs, and ornamental grasses to be utilized in a park strip. And park strips narrower than five feet shall have the trees placed behind the sidewalk instead of inside of the park strip. I, I like this image because it shows a wide variety of some of the materials that people can use in the park strip. Of course, it's not limited to those, but it gives an idea. You'll also note throughout the amendments that there is considerable language in each code section requiring the use of drip irrigation systems. Trees, shrubs, and other plantings are still required, and all such plantings, even water-wise plants, require water in order to establish themselves. Drip systems are effective in that they deliver water directly to the plant where it can be absorbed for the plant's use. This will avoid any unnecessary overspray that we often see on sidewalks and asphalt. Bubble, root, uh, excuse me, drip systems are good because they water the, the roots of the plant. And so the ordinance amendments throughout the, the landscaping codes require drip systems instead of spray heads and so forth. You'll also note that many of the proposed amendments authorize the use of artificial turf grass as pictured on the slide. Artificial turf today can almost look like real grass, except in the winter, <laughs> where it looks nice and green, where everybody else's lawns are dead. But it is an excellent ground cover for areas where thirsty grass is not necessary or wanted, and it does look nice. So. Off-street parking does have some requirements in regards to landscaping. The code amendments basically just prohibit the use of sod in parking areas. Uh, authorizes turf grass and then requires drip irrigation for trees and shrubs. Uh, this is just a graphic showing that landscaping can be done very well and very effectively in a, in a parking lot without using thirsty grass and sod. And then there's some, also some amendments to Title VII, Chapter 11 Design Review. Again, pretty similar. Turf grass, no sod. Um, drip irrigation systems and artificial turf and so forth. Now the multifamily zones are a little bit different. Multifamily design standards do not prohibit the use of turf or sod. This is done because our ordinances require amenities for residential communities in order to improve the livability of a particular development. Amenities such as play areas, sports fields, picnic areas, and so forth are not very comfortable when they have to be performed on cobble mulches or areas full of yucca. Okay? So, we want to maintain the livability of our multifamily residential areas. This illustration kind of gives a good understanding of what we can do in our multifamily zones. The areas utilized for recreation purposes, obviously we want to maintain the, the grass, the sod. But in areas that are perimeter to those play areas, those recreation areas, areas that are just not wide enough or able to be utilized, let's do some water-wise landscaping in there. Let's use some cobble mulches and so forth. And the amendments proposed in the code actually reflect this kind of a landscape plan. Residential districts, single family residential districts, the code amendments um, actually would require that any preliminary plans approved after, after April 1st uh, would be limited to 50% of their front yard and side yards landscaped as natural lawn grass. So that's any new developments that are coming in. And um, this would encourage property owners to, you know, do a mix of these landscapes to conserve water. And there's nothing in the code that would prohibit a property owner from doing entirely water-free landscapes. So this is an image I found that shows some, some xeriscaping. You'll notice that there's quite a bit of bark mulch and rock in there. And it illustrates that you can do an attractive landscape. Uh, one of the things I do want to mention and point out, though, that, that xeriscaping is actually more labor intensive than sod as far as maintenance goes. 
And so even though it does conserve water, people need to maintain it. Uh, as Paul likes to say, zero scaping is not zero scaping. So one of the things we need to try to do is entertain or educate people that if you're going to do zero scape, if you're going to do dry scape, it has to be maintained. And then Title 7, Chapter 16, the Table of Development Standards. Our commercial and industrial landscaping standards are already pretty bare minimum, and they do not require any sod whatsoever. So the only amendment to that code uh, just suggests that we re the developer use trees from our street tree selection guide. And this is just a commercial site plan showing some zero scaping on one of their, their park strips. Uh, subdivisions, pretty similar to the others. It specifies some tree spacing, prohibits the use of sod, pretty much what we've already gone over in other, in other parts of the code. So the mayor also asked me to present the uh, River, or the Riverton City, the Tooele City Tree Selection Guide. Um, using my experience as a former certified arborist and, and horticulture trainee for uh, landscape architecture, I, I took the opportunity to evaluate our tree selection guide and take a look at what, what we currently recommend and maybe make some alterations to it. Uh, my intention was to provide a very simple short list that is easy for the public to read, not provide something that is complicated or, or gets into botanical jargon and so forth. So the tree species selection guide recommends certain size of trees for certain size of park strips. And that's important because putting a tree in the wrong area can be can cause some problems. Uh, trees are great for communities. Trees provide uh, shade, they reduce heat effect, they provide food for people and animals. They also um, have been proven to increase property values. Uh, a house with a mature tree that's healthy in its front yard has been, can, can actually increase the sales price by 10%. So there's a lot of benefits to having trees, but trees placed in the wrong area can be quite devastating. And I've got a collection of some pictures here showing why we're looking at this. Um, this is a big tree in a five foot park strip. You can notice the roots are actually growing over the curb. Um, that tree has a mark on it, which looks like they're probably going to come by at some point and take that tree out. These trees look pretty normal in the park strip, but if you'll notice the sidewalk in the middle of the graphic is, is being lifted by the tree's buttress roots. Uh, those are the big roots that provide the support for the tree. They get into the concrete and they just pop it right up. Uh, this one is a, just a, has a knotted root system because the roots just aren't branching out the way a tree should. And then this one's probably my favorite. You can see that it's lifted the, the sidewalk and the asphalt about six inches. It's pushing the curb out. Hmm. And then the root is just a gigantic root ball. And this is dangerous not only for the street but also for the adjacent buildings because that root, that tree has no root structure. And at some point, maybe, the, a strong wind will knock that tree over onto an adjacent building. And then we have a nice wide park strip where big trees can thrive. And the, you'll notice the sidewalk's in good condition and there's no issues there with the trees doing any damage to adjacent streets. It's not only underground where trees can cause problems, it's also above ground. This is a, uh, a tree that the power company has pruned away from the power poles. Uh, it's shaped like a V and that creates problems for the tree structurally because the tree is pulling on separate directions and could ultimately split the trunk. Uh, this is a Crimson King maple that is usually a very round growth habit and it is a flat tree. It's an umbrella tree. This is not a diss against the Rocky Mountain Power guys. They have excellent arborists and they do their, they do their job well. But it, you, sometimes you just can't put big trees under power lines. And this one makes me laugh because they've pruned away half the tree. And if you notice the base of the tree, there is a bulge near the, the, the trunk flare. That tree ultimately at some point is going to fall over. And so that's, it's just not wise to put trees in wrong places. 
I really like this slide because it demonstrates that whoever put these trees in knew what they were doing. The park strip's only three feet, so they didn't put the trees there. You'll notice above head there's power lines, and they moved the trees far enough back from the sidewalk to prevent any clearance issues for pedestrians. Those trees are crab apples. They are small, they don't get very large, and they definitely don't get tall. So whoever planned this knew exactly what they were doing. So in formulating the, the, the list of trees, I use trees that are known performers, trees that do well in park strips, and you can see them around town quite often. They're trees that tolerate the salt overspray. They're, they're trees that tolerate vehicle emissions. They're trees that uh, tolerate the heat that comes off of the asphalt from the road. Uh, those are good solid trees. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out too is even though the, the, the plan does recommend medium trees for park strips five to eight feet wide, medium trees will get big. Uh, the, 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 when talking about large trees versus medium sized trees, that refers to basically the growth rate of the tree and the longevity of the tree. So a honey locust that lives 40 years is not gonna get as big as a bur oak that lives 200 years. Uh, trees that live longer just get bigger. They just keep growing. But um, that's the tree, the uh, street tree sp species list that we're proposing. Uh, that's not part of the ordinance amendments, but we would like to have the council approve that through resolution so we can make that an official document. Uh, those are the ordinance amendments we're proposing, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions or thoughts the city council might have. So I was curious about number five. If we, can, we, can we require people to put trees on their private property? Is that legal for us to do? And does that cause us some kind of issue with the citizen if we're telling them they can't put it in their five-foot park strip but if it's not that big, but we, they have to put one behind the, in their yard? We do require trees on private property for commercial development. So I would think that we could do the same thing for residential. Yeah, that would be my only concern. I think everything else was okay for me. I've had several residents reach out and ask for this type of an ordinance so that they can do the turf buyback, mm -hmm. you know, because they've read about it also. I'm sorry, I missed it. I already did that myself without the turf buyback. <laughs> but um, so I think it's great. And, you know, trees on parks, I I'm, I'm, was happy to see the tree list because my developer required ash trees and they're a disaster as you know, so I, I was, I think the tree list is great. Yeah, that's one of the things that the list does include. There, there's a lot of popular trees in Utah that grow well in certain places, do not do well in park strips. And I, I made sure that the list included those trees. So, so thank you. Any other comments? I think it's great as well. All right, any other discussion on this? Okay. okay, thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Council. Thanks, Andrew. We'll move on to item six, which is our closed meeting. We do have a closed meeting tonight to discuss property acquisition. So we will uh, recess from here and then reconvene in the large conference room for a closed meeting. I'll make a motion that we re uh, recess this meeting and uh, reconvene into a closed session to discuss property acquisition. Well, a motion from Councilwoman Manzio and a second from Dave, did you? Mm -hmm. a second from Councilman McCall. We'll take it to a vote. Councilwoman Manzio? Aye. Councilman Hansen? Aye. Councilman McCall? Aye. I think Councilman Graff is off the phone now. And Councilman Brady, I vote aye.